this meeting is being recorded. So recording has started. You know that because it just said it. This is the design recitation. By now you've met design tools and you should be relatively comfortable using them. But now we want to go through a stack from just using the tool to uh, parametric hierarchic algorithmic and then with Bobkin, and then after that, look ahead to the rapidly unfolding story of AI meets design. So go ahead, Bobkin. Okay, thank you, Neil. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna first show some um, parametric modeling with FreeCAD, then uh, uh, algorithmic modeling with OpenSCAD, and uh, also, I'll show a demo with Antimony. It's a really cool program. So let me start with FreeCAD. Okay, so. Let me delete this one. And so in order to make um, parameters in FreeCAD, we, we need to create a spreadsheet. In order to do it, we we select the spreadsheet menu from the wor uh, different workbenches we have in FreeCAD and create a spreadsheet. In our case, it is created. So it, it looks like a regular spreadsheet page. The only thing you need to do is to put some names of your parameters, put some values, which I, I, I'm going to do now. And um, uh, right click, add a short name. So in this case, I'll name it NS. And for convenience, you can put the short name next to it. Okay. So now I have uh, I have these five parameters which I'm going to use in my uh, modeling, which I'll show you in a second. I changed the workbench to part design. I've created a, a new body, created a sketch, selected a, a plane where I want to sketch. And um, what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna uh, try to model a, a beautiful snowflake-like uh, snap kit, okay? So I'm, I'm drawing a rectangle with this tool, adding lines. And notice when I move to, um, when I come closer to the points or to the lines, different constraints appear and disappear. These are really helpful when, when you, uh, instead of manually adding these constraints, you, you can easily, uh like use them so i'll show you the difference if i wouldn't use if i wouldn't wait the this point to snap like this these points would be disconnected the alternative to connect them i had to select them and uh, hit this uh, this constraint okay now i'm trimming this line that i don't need so this is my joint where the uh, where the slot slots are going to be connecting. I'm creating a symmetry constraint with these two lines with these two points um, reference to this line. This is the symmetry constraint, and I also select these two lines and adding the equality constraint. Now you can see that they are symmetrically constrained. Okay. What I do next, I add two construction lines, which which are not going to be uh, affecting our model, but they're going to just help us for the for reference. I'm selecting those two and hitting this um, tool. Now you, you see the color changed, and they 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 work as a construction line. They don't affect the model. Now let's put the parameters really quick. So this one is the joint 
um, joint X, X dimension. This one is joint Y direction. And <clears throat> one interesting thing about the parameters is that inside the parameters, you can always uh, always uh, connect them. Uh, you, you can uh, make formulas and connections between the parameters. In our case, the joint Y is double the size of joint X. As you can see, it's, uh, it's really easy to, um, to create dependencies in the parameters. Okay. So whenever I change the, so it was five, now I'm, I'm, I'll make it three, okay? So joint Y becomes six. And in our sketch, let me um, reopen the sketch. The dimensions are changed, notice, okay? So I'll put this dimension too. This is the radius. Uh, okay. This is the side, the rectangle side, uh, this one. And the only parameter that, the, the only constraint that, I, uh, the only freedom that my sketch has is this. You, you can always drag your sketch to see what what are the freedoms that your sketch has. So if I put the, the size of this angle, notice that my sketch becomes green. That means it's fully constrained. So, and, and notice that in this formula editor, I can put, uh, um, I can put, the formula. So I'm dividing 360, which is the full circle, to the number of number our number of segments we are going to have. Okay. So my sketch is fully constrained now. I I'm going to pad it really quick. So. I'll put here JY, oops, JX again. Okay. And do a pole and make a polar pattern. So the same way, whenever you see this blue uh, affix buttons, you can uh, put parameters. So NS. Okay. Now, well, when I hit OK, I'll get my part. So if you want to remove these lines, you hit the polar pattern and there's a there's an option to refine it. So you hit true. The defaultly it's false. So now when it, it refines, you get this beautiful shape. And if I change the parameters here, so let me change some couple of them. Yeah. Now you see you get a different shape. So another thing that I want to show you really quick is how to create uh, angles, which you're going to need for your molding and casting week. So instead of padding this sketch, I'm going to create another sketch in the same plane. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to use the previous sketch. I'm going to use, by, by using this tool, I'm going to call uh, individual lines from the previous sketch that we did. And now I can, uh, I can <clears throat> draw new sketch by using the previous sketch, previous sketches constraints, okay? So 
I will similarly I will add this one. Okay. See, I I didn't wait for it to snap and the points were not connected. Okay. I trim this one. I, okay, wait. So I can tell these two points to overlap. This one also. Okay. And now I have the symmetry based on the previous sketch. No need to add new symmetry constraints. So in order to create, I'm, I'm going, I want to have uh, an angle on the side of my of my model so i i just gonna need a, a slight um, difference a, a small difference between these two a small distance between these two lines so i will introduce a new um, um a new parameter okay so it's gonna be uh, the draft angle okay so I'll make it five. I'll name it DA. DA. So now I will tell Frika that I want this two points distance to be. Oh, yeah. One more thing I forgot. But then, yeah, yeah. Just a second. So notice that my two sketches are in the same plane. In order to move the sketch up and down, you go to the attachment menu here from the data. And um, from the position, you also can input the, the, the parameters here. So I'll change the Z parameter of the, this sketch to be uh j j x again okay so now my two sketches are uh apart from each other by j x so now i return to the to the sketcher and make this distance to be equal uh, mm, tangent of the spreadsheet draft angle. So FreeCAD will automatically calculate the formulas you enter here and in the spreadsheet, where which which way is convenient for you, you can use. So multiplied by again spreadsheet JX. Okay. So what this does, this makes sure that the angle that will connect this to that. Um, so, okay, just um, l let me loft this shape and you, you'll see, okay? Just a second and I'll, I'll explain in a moment. So I'm selecting these two sketches and using the loft tool here. And I, I have this shape now. And this this face, you, as you can see, it has, um, it is five, um, it is tilted from the original uh, vertical axis by five um, degrees. If I make it 45 here, you can see, you can see the, you can see that angle better, okay? So I'll make it maybe 10, okay. So this is the same way I can polar pattern this. I'll just put here five just to show you. Yeah, and in this case, you, you're gonna get the same shape, but with, um, with an option to control this angle, okay. 
this is this is regarding free cut so i i i really advise you to check out chris um chris um tutorials with from FreeCAD. Chris is the instructor from Alto Fab Lab and also Andrew's uh, tutorials for uh, for more interesting stuff. You you can you can model really cool stuff using these tutorials and also uh, get acquainted with some uh, more advanced tools. So Algorithmic. So there are different uh, softwares to explore with algorithmic. You even can do that with uh, FreeCAD. There are some um, some modules you you can use directly in FreeCAD. But one of the uh, famous ones is OpenSCAD. So the it's it's open source. It has a lot of libraries. Uh, and a big community you can you can join ask them questions follow the news there's also open js card which is uh, which is actually online you 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 can uh, put your code directly here and preview in the browser there's the cut query which was introduced during the last year's recitation, you can check last year's recitation and find out more about Cut Query. It also has really cool uh, libraries and is growing. It's it's relatively new program. And there's Antimony. So Antimony was uh, built by Matt Keeter, who was a former Pub Academy student. And what is also open source and free to use. And one of the main differences between uh, OpenSCAD and uh, Antimony is that Antimony uses the graphical and block. Antimony uses blocks to, to create the algorithmic uh, modeling. So now I will, I will really quick show you um, an example that was made by Onik Babajanian, last year's Fab Academy student. So this is the one of the assignments that you, you need to make to test your tolerances of the joints. So let me really quick explain this. So I, I'll, <clears throat> this file is included and I'll, I'll add also the free cut file at the end. So this one is the number of fragments. The bigger it is, the more CPU and processing power your software takes. But the, the bigger it is, it also makes your um, the, um, your sides smoother. So if I I make this uh, one and preview it, so you can see how this rectangle like this circle change to and the bigger i uh, the bigger i go it, it it changes the shape okay so um here only created a module and uh, these are the variables he created so notice there are uh, again j joint x joint y a step of increment that each joint will will be different from the previous one so um then he he created a, a cube then he used a for for loop to to create another cube and from by by this command he he moved with each iteration and also added the um, change the joint x diameter the dimension uh, by by the step by the amount of steps the iteration takes and optionally he also created this small cylinder here which we can comment to 
to see it disappearing from this part. And, uh, and by just putting all this small chunk of code into the difference, um, this um, difference operation, they, they just, um, he subtracted all these um, bodies. Okay. And the last one, this projection cut were, is to get the, the 2D shape of the thing. And you can export it with different file formats. It's really easy to do. Okay. Let's move on to antimony. So, So this is also the one of the, uh, the this, this video shows how to make the, the parametric snap fit kit. And as you can see by right clicking, you select the different shapes. You have the option to select 2D and 3D. So he created a polygon and now he is changing the radius. He um so he's going to connect the, this n which is the number of the sites to the uh oh uh, excuse me so this is the uh, radius so he connected the radius to the y uh, coordinate of the of this rectangle as you can see then he creates a triangle and notice that he can um he, he can drag and drop the points manually. So he's gonna put them where he wants and then fine tune the, these dimensions. Let me fast forward for that one. So he's, he's, he's uh, fine tuning the numbers. And then he's gonna add a union um, block and connect these two shapes. One. So the this is the pole. This is the same polar array that we used in FreeCAD. Uh, he's connecting the number of um, the sides of the polygon to the number of occurrences of the array, and there's a shape input where he adds this union, and now. Notice he's going to change the number of the polygon and the whole shape, uh, the whole model will um, change accordingly. So uh, then the, the last, last thing he's going to do, he's going to make a difference between the, the polygon and the union. Or, or the, the array, I'm sorry. And then, then he has this, uh, this file ready. Okay, he mistakenly changes the uh, radius, but then this is the number. Okay, this is antimony. I had really, I had a lot of fun um, working with this in 2019 when I was doing my FAD Academy. So one very um, popular uh, option for um, algorithmic modeling is also Grasshopper, which is um, which is a plugin for Rhino. This is very popular among uh, architects. So you you can create really nice shapes um, by it, it, it is very much like antimony, but uh, it, it combines the power of Rhino, the power of modeling of Rhino, and also the parametric, graphical parametric modeling. Okay. So next is the, I have just five to 10, five minutes. So I, I'll try to make this quick. So, the topology optimization and generative design. These two concepts are easy to um, are are easy to confuse because they are 
very similar in some terms. I've included some topology um, um, optimization by with precut and with fusion. Although I think fusion the, the option is free for fusion. You can also try it in fusion. In with FreeCAD, it's gonna be a bit hard. You're gonna add you you need to add some uh, uh, additional plugins to use it. So uh, generative design. What the main uh, difference is that in topology optimization, we draw a, sh a shape or a modi. We um, we add the uh, forces that gonna uh, gonna apply to the model and the software uh, based on these inputs removes the materials from the parts where uh, the, it leaves the critical parts the material where it it is critical for the forces to withstand and removes the extra ones and uh, you can you can make the extremes and uh, there's a wide range that you can vary by um, so it, it can remove as well, like too much material or um, a little bit material. So in in generative design, it's uh, it's different that um, generative design gives you a lot of new options by growing new parts. So it can it can go about um, beyond your original design. So the, look, this is the original design and it is limited. So if we we would run this part in topology optimization, it would reduce some parts, make some holes, but it wouldn't grow uh, more like additional parts from the above, uh, outside of the model. But it, so this is a very easy representation of these differences. And generative design usually takes more, more processing power and it um, and it gives you a lot of different options how your model can look like. So this mm, I couldn't find uh, an available picture where it shows like it can give you fifty or one hundred different options of the same part. And sometimes it's hard to tell. Mm, it's counterintuitive for humans to understand why um, why there's a asymmetrical. Um, sides of the part, but the software calculated this um, based on some um, previous inputs. So anyway, this, are, this is all I wanted to say. And then I also uh, added um, a list of uh, softwares that you can use to for generative modeling. So one thing to mention is also that um, for generative modeling, uh, the fusion um, charges you more money than the, even if you subscribe to the yearly plan or the monthly plan, you have to pay for the generative um, option, generative design tools. Okay. Now I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Quentin. Thank you. That's very clear. Um, any questions for Babkin? Otherwise, I will proceed with briefly talking about AI tools. Um, let me share the screen. Okay, let's see. Can you see that? Yes, yes, we can Good. see. Thank you. So we had this amazing recitation um, during the MIT class given by these four grad students. And it was just so good. That there was basically nothing I could add to that. So I will reuse the slides they had. 
um, and try to explain uh, how you can use tools to generate text, images, and now 3D um, from basically any anything you imagine. So first, text. You, I'm sure you've all heard of ChatGPT. It's in the news almost every day right now. It's based on GPT-3, which is the most extensive um, language neural network that has been trained. And the way it works is you start with a prompt, and then the network has been trained to imagine what comes next. But the prompt could literally be anything. So here, um, we start just with one sentence. This is a blog post written by some famous author, and then it proceeds with something very plausible. It can go on for almost forever because uh, it will always generate new words that, that come next. Um, but then something funny happens. Someone found out that you can also ask for code because it has been trained on pretty much anything on the internet. There was also snippets of code. And so now they're asking for a very specific algorithm in Rust, which is a quite recent language, and it's not a problem. It also generates a documentation for you. So it's incre incredibly convenient. Um, now, the code is not always correct, but it's generally speaking, it's a good start. Um, so those are the three links to various tools that you can use. Uh, GPT-3 is what give birth to all of that research field. Uh, but ChatGPT is the free to use tool um, in which you can just type any prompts you want and you will get an answer. So anyone can have access to that. I happen to have an account and the tool is open right now. So if you have an idea, we can, we can go and generate some text. And it could literally be anything. I'll show you some examples later. Okay, let's go on. Um, next, we can talk a bit about generating images. So there's this tool. It's also quite famous. It's made by OpenAI as well. It's called Dali. And those are some examples here. But essentially, it takes a sentence and will generate an image for you that matches um, your prompt. You get a few um you know alternative images you can select one of them if you want to refine it or if you want to generate more like it that's the basic way to use the tool and so Valdemar uh, a student taking the MIT class generated some very provocative images like the the last selfie on earth would look like that I suppose uh this is if the sun exploded etc I think these ones he might have used mid journey for it which is also a very good tool. Um, I will show you Mid Journey in a moment. This is a remix of the Mona Lisa. And you can also modify an existing image, which sounds like a legal nightmare, but you could take literally any picture and generate alternate versions of that picture. And you can also edit pictures. You will select an area that you want to modify and you have to give a description for the whole image. It's a bit counterintuitive, but you're not just describing the parts you want to replace, but the whole picture. And it will edit just this part such that, you know, the whole image is coherent and matches your request. They also have a tool for letting you extend images, like imagine what, what's outside of that. And so, uh, this is the an extended version of the girl with a pearl. Um, you can refine existing models because they might not know a specific concept if it's um, you know if it has not been trained on that. And so Valdemar further trains the network using pictures of Neil, and then he could generate you know Neil 
in the space station uh, on the moon, meeting Einstein, working on Terminator, and the DJ set, and playing football. So those are some examples of image um, tools. And Valdemar had a very good remark about that. Uh, it's more useful to get inspiration if you want to do digital fabrication from those tools, because the output will never be quite what you need in your project, but you can get really good inspiration. But this is one example where he was looking for a concept or an assignment, and the <laughs> ChatGPT provided him with a very bizarre idea for a laser cut uh, coffin. And so it gives you a whole description of the project as well. And this was his assignment. Um, in another assignment, he was looking for shapes for a PCB and then what the PCB might be saying if it's possessed by a, <laughs> by a mystical entity. I really find this text fascinating. And then he, is where he was looking for, you know, concept arts for variables. And in this project, it's really quite crazy. He generated a phase. So first he asked for a, an image of a surreal phase in the style of abject art using Tally. And he got the image on the left. Then he used another AI tool to generate a 3D version of that image because you know it's just a flat image. If you want to do a 3D model from that, you're going to have a hard time. But there happens to be a tool, I think it's from Adobe, that lets you um, infer a 3D image from a, from a flat image. Then he used Blender, I believe, to turn that into a fully fledged 3D model that he could print. So this is a print that was made on a Stratasys J55 printer, which has full color capability. It's very, very similar to the initial image. So that was a very impressive uh, tool de force. And this is another example of, what was it? A sound shaker in the shape of an axolotl, I think. <laughs> so here. He made a 3D version in Blender, and he's showing that the material and the colors are very consistent. So this is all images and text. Um, OK, here he was looking for inspiration using Midjourney. You can also reverse engineer an image if you want to look for a prompt that would give you that image. Um, there is a tool for that. It's still very experimental. And finally, if you're good with image editing, you know you always have the option of mixing and matching from different uh, inspiration sources. So he, he was making a fully fledged concept art using different images from Midjourney. So Midjourney is free to use. Dali, I think, is free to try, but then it's not super expensive to use either. And Stable Diffusion is completely open source. You can go ahead and, and run it on your computer if you want. Finally, uh, 3D models is still very experimental, but there are promising results for that. In this one, they were adding style to an existing mesh but they were not generating the mesh itself. Uh, but what's being done right now is just that. You give a text prompt and it generates a mesh for you. But it's not exactly a mesh for now. Um, due to limitations, it's much easier for a neural network to generate another format. Um, it's a neural radiance field, and it basically describes the light rays being emitted by the object in all directions. But it's relatively easy to get a mesh from that. So it's not too much of a limitation. 
The only issue I think is the resolution is not all that crazy for now. So you're not gonna get super high resolution meshes um, if you convert those fields to, to triangle meshes. But yeah, those are very recent advances. I think in the next following months, we, we will see even more impressive results from these guys. Um, so this was a general introduction to those tools, but I was curious and I tried them myself to generate some Pan Academy related results. Um, there are some questions first, let me check. 3D from 2D. Oh yeah. Uh, it's worth a minute. Let me let me look for that. I think it's one of these tools. Yeah. Um, it was a brand new tool from Adobe. Uh, I didn't use it myself, so I'm not sure. I'm fleeting to the photo in Photoshop. It might be integrated in Photoshop. Oh, in Premiere too. Anyhow, you'll, you'll have to look for it, but it was from Adobe, from what I recall. So let's see. Um, first, I tried to get some inspiration for a laser cut object using Mid Journey. So this was the text I gave it, a wooden laser cut chair in the shape of a cat, and I got four really impressive results that really look like photographs. And what's cool about Midjourney is you get to refine an image if you really like it. So I picked the one on the top left and I generated a really high resolution version of that. So that could give you inspiration very quickly for an assignment. Um, then I tried to make some PCB in the shape of the Mandelbrot set fractal. And this is what I got. It's completely nonsensical, but um, who knows? You might find a way to to make a PCB that looks more or less like that. Then I tried to generate some Arduino C++ codes for an assignment. And so this is very much valid, I believe. Um, this is code that moves the server when you press a button. Now you have to notice my, my prompt was a bit ambiguous. I said, just moving a server when you push a button. And it's a bit ambiguous. So what's, <laughs> what ChatGPT did in this case is um, it moves the server as long as the button is pushed. But then when it's not, the server is not moving. So this is not quite a move. What I had in mind, I, I thought it would move to one position when I press it and then another position when I release it. But you can see in the code here that there's only an action when, when the button is, is pressed. And it also assumed that I was using a, a pull up on, on the button, which is very reasonable. This is probably what I would actually do. So this was a very su surprising, very outstanding result from ChatGPT. Uh, APIs to use these tools? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So you could make requests and, and use these tools interactively. Um, then I was curious whether we could get valid SVG files from ChatGPT, and again, it, it delivered. So, <laughs> well, I was very vague, I asked for a cool SVG, and this is what I get. I'm not sure about the cool aspects, but it was a valid find for sure. Um, 
there was even an animation, if I remember. And then why not even all new assignments for the class while we are there? Um, it was very vague again, and I was just asking for a novel assignment for Fab Academy, and it figures that the assignment could be about variables, which again is very, very reasonable. I could really see it. <laughs> and finally, if you want to impress Neil, apparently this is what you need to do. <laughs> okay, so I think we're good with time. Nice. So I have ChatGPT over here. I also have Midjourney in another tab. Let me let me show you that. This is Midjourney, and people are always busy using it. So you will always see what other people are, are generating. There's no real privacy with Midjourney. Um, do you have ideas? Is there an image that that someone wants to generate? I have an ID by default. Let's see. First, as Quentin does that, let me know the latter part, the former part with Babkin is fairly mature. The latter part is unfolding very, very, very quickly. And right now there's a big gulf between AI design tools and CAD tools. And so an active research area right now is it's not currently possible to start with constrained design and then give imaginative descriptions or start with a uh, large language model and give it constraints. And so a number of groups are working on that that's coming in the future. Yeah, very true. Um, there's something I didn't show, but you can attempt to do open sketch scripts in ChatGPT. Um, and it seems sort of valid. So that's promising, but it's more, more of a hack. Uh, so let's see, a brand new type of digital fabrication machine in a high-tech fab lab. It's generating the image um, and refining it on the fly. Let's see what happens. 62%. Ninety-three percent. Okay, I think we we have the full resolution, but I have to look for it. There we go. So Neil, what what is the top left doing? Well, sadly, they're fun cases, but it hasn't gone far beyond what looks like a conventional 3D printer inside. <laughs> well, we can have a higher resolution of one. So I can say upscale. Yeah, the top left, I like. And it's um, going gonna, gonna to give me a really high resolution. Course, there, there's a, a strange new field emerging, which is people who are prompt engineers who simply specialize in coming up with the prompts for these. Absolutely. Now, see, Ricardo's asking about uh, meshes. The initial um, <clears throat> engines like Midjourney and Dali were just images, but some of the research projects Quentin showed uh, the AI engines do have actually real 3D representations. And so part of this moving into the middle is uh, giving real representations, not fake ones. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Seems to be very busy. Um, we added just a brief clause to the student agreements. And the answer is absolutely right that it's fine to use AI tools, and that's increasingly 
going to be part of workflows. I'll talk about that on Wednesday for embedded programming. But like any sort of uh, plagiarism, uh, you need to credit uh, the tools and sources. Um, also note, not all, but most of these started with free access and betas, uh, but they're all pretty quickly moving to <clears throat> paid plans. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, because these all need a lot of computing. Yeah. Uh, we, we got our high solution. Uh, yeah, it's a cool industrial design, but it uh, looks like a fairly conventional machine. It does. But I like the space behind. <laughs> Looks like a fun place to work in. Uh, next, we have ChatGPT here. So we could ask for some Arduino code or inspiration for this, an assignment. Any ideas? Let's see, Ricardo is saying, should you document the prompts? Absolutely. So Absolutely. the goal of your documentation is to reproduce what you did. So the prompts are, are essential for that. Well, I think, it, it, well, people think of challenges. I think the single best thing I ever, craziest thing I ever saw in ChatGPT was somebody gave it a detailed prompt to boot a Linux workstation. And it actually made a running Linux workstation that was completely emulated. Uh, bash shell, you could, yeah. Um, and so there, there was no Linux running, but uh, the, the detailed prompt caused it to start a terminal and you could type Linux commands. Yeah, I have tried, but I didn't manage to, okay. to get that result. And this is good lead in. I'll, at the end of Wednesday's class, I'm going to talk about the rapidly growing use of AI tools in coding. Okay, let's, let's just do one part. How about let's try recursion? Say, um, write a Python program that writes a Rust program. Of itself? That, well, oh, actually, sorry, here, back up. Well, actually, yeah, um, okay, that's fine. That's fine. So it used to run much faster, but it's too popular right now. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, Resp <laughs> it's doing it. It's actually doing it, yeah. So that's a triple quoted Python program. <laughs> oh, it actually did it. Here, um, Quentin, uh, stop generating and Type write a quine, Q U I N E program in C. No, write a, write a letter A, quine, Q U I N E. Q U I N E, Q -U -U -I -N -E program yeah. in that's, C. That's what these are names, right? Right. Self, so th this was a, a mentor at Harvard, a famous philosopher who wrote C? programs that write themselves. Yeah. So see what it does with that. It should be, should be all right. Well, it's on one line, but I'm sure it's valid. Okay. Uh, 
it's especially nice that you get a, an explanation that comes along. Ricardo, what are you asking? The Python scripts for generating trick lookup tables? Oh, trigonometry, you mean? That's almost too easy for ChatGPT. <laughs> but I can try. Nice. And again, we'll talk more on Wednesday. Uh, the code that it writes is almost always almost right. Uh, <laughs> it, it can be full of bugs. It can be, it can occasionally hallucinate things that are made up. And it can also infringe copyrights are all issues. Oh, and that's interesting. Jason is noting, uh, again, along with prompt engineers that are now prompt injection and tax, um, working back to find the prompts that were used. <laughs> to, to 10. Okay. So we're up to an hour. You, uh, Babkin, that was a, a lovely tour. You should all be comfortable with that. Um, he, uh, he didn't talk about, but one more thing, um, one step further is in something like FreeCAD, absolutely everything is programmable. So it's very easy to write little programs uh, building on what you did. Um, then Quentin, that was a nice tour of the AI world. Uh, the, the coding is immediately useful. The images are intriguing. And then a research area for the future, which could involve some of you is now moving in towards the middle about how these two things meet and it's unfolding very rapidly. And so with that, thanks to Quentin, thanks to Bobkin, I'll stop recording.